Rebecca. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I'm good. Nice, nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, you too. Um, well, yeah, thanks for being willing to chat about your kind of musical journey and um maybe in a non-traditional sense, it's you know, taken a few bends in the road. Yes, so yeah. <laughs> I, I think it can be very inspiring to other people in the music industry. Um, so yeah, I'd love to, so. um, yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to share your story with us and, um, anything you've learned along the way or anything that shocked you along the way or that you weren't expecting. Um, yeah. So you want me to take it away? To, yeah, go ahead. Take it away. Well, I'm Rachel Aaron and I, um, I've been playing the piano since, you know, as most of us, since I was about six or seven and, you know, I always enjoyed it. I think I played a lot of times just because I was bored. We didn't have all the screens and everything. I grew up in um, a really small town in Kansas and we lived kind of out in the country. So I didn't have a lot of friends nearby to go out and play with. So I just played the piano for fun and mm -hmm. I would, you know, pick up anything I could get my hands on and just sight read and play. I don't know that I loved practicing so much, but that I loved playing. So mm -hmm. I would just sight read and got really good at sight reading actually. Um, and then when it was time to go to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, I think it's a little unfair to make 18 year olds like try and decide what they're supposed to do mm -hmm. in their life because you don't know at that point. So um, I decided to do music mostly because I didn't know what else I was good at and what to do. So I was, I started as a music major thinking I'll figure it out along the way. Maybe I'll change to something else, but ended up kind of falling in love with being a music major and studying piano performance and had an amazing teacher, um, a Korean woman who uh, had gone to Juilliard and Columbia and she was the most incredible performer, but also an absolutely incredible teacher. And um, wow, I still- amazing. Yeah, I think it's unusual to have both of mm -hmm. those things. And I learned yeah. so much from her in undergrad and still keep in touch with her a little bit to this day. Um, mm -hmm. But then I would say the one thing that was missing in my undergrad education is that when I was about to graduate from that program, I still had no idea what I was going to do with myself for work. I still loved playing the piano, but I was like, how am I going to turn this into actually supporting myself. And thank goodness, one of the voice teachers who taught at the college approached me and said, one of our staff accompanists is leaving. Would you be interested in doing a little part-time accompanying for the voice department when, after you graduate? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure, I would love to, like I had done a little bit of accompanying, you know, through school and stuff. Um, I think I was just like shocked and amazed that someone was actually going to pay me to play the piano. <laughs> like maybe I wouldn't have to go get an office job, you know, and just play the piano for fun. So I said yes and uh, started doing that part time and then got a church job and um, kind of fell in love with accompanying and realized that I had a little bit of natural affinity for it and was learning since I was working at the college that I had attended, the teachers were mentoring me and the other accompanists knew me and were kind of mentoring me as well along the way. Um, so I decided to pursue some graduate studies in accompanying, got my master's, had a couple of um, full-time accompanying jobs at um, universities, um, eventually got my doctorate in collaborative piano and moved out to California for an accompanying job at a university out here. Did that for a while, about, I guess, seven years maybe before COVID. And then when COVID happened, the accompanying stuff like kind of got turned upside down on its head. Yeah. And I ended up losing my position at the university, um, and just started to my, at that time I had a young son. And so I was also a little bit, um, I don't know, a little disillusioned maybe with the whole accompanying thing, because it was so many nights and weekends and I couldn't mm -hmm. see how that was going to be sustainable with having, a, a young toddler at home. Mm -hmm. So I think 
honest, if I'm being completely honest, when COVID first shut everything down, I felt a little relieved because I had just gotten to the point where I was working so many hours and wanted to be home more. So, um, during COVID took some time to kind of figure out what I was going to do next. I started teaching a couple of neighborhood kids. Um, it was interesting during COVID, our little neighborhood, we would, they didn't close down our parks. And so all of us that had little kids or a few of us that had little kids would go out to the park every day and just nice. have like, let the kids play. We would, you know, sit six feet apart around the edge of the park and the kids <laughs> would just go play. And we're like, we've got to get out of the house. Yeah. Like just let them yeah. play. So, um, got to know some of the neighborhood kids and started teaching a couple of them piano. And that's when I really kind of got interested in the creative side of piano teaching. I think up until that point, I had taught more, um, older beginners, adult students, things like that. So teaching the young kids and having a young son Mm -hmm. was a little different for me. And I started like getting interested in all the resources available and the games and, um, that's actually, I think when I found top music and Tim Topham started listening mm-hmm. to his podcasts. And, um, so I just started getting interested in that. And then, um, a couple is of years that later, when you started, is that when you started creating your, um, I don't remember the name of the resource the, you have, like the, the sound effects stories. Sound, yeah. I was going to say SoundCloud and I knew that was wrong. Yeah. The sound stories. <laughs> Yeah. So I actually started creating those for my students, um, just as like a word document. Like I would just write out a story and have them put in little sound effects and stuff just as a fun activity. And then it took me a few years to figure out how to like make it beautiful and put it up for other. So others could use it. Yeah. Yeah. But that is a great resource for creativity for those younger. Yeah. It's so great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's kind of where that started. And then Um, As we were coming out of COVID, I was offered the job that I have now, the full-time position at a music conservatory um, to get the conservatory reopened after COVID. It had been shut down for a couple of years. And it's really, it's more of a music, a community music school. It's not like a fancy conservatory. It's just a school for kids to come and do lessons. And it's connected with a church and a K through eight school. So that's where our students are coming from. So now I'm doing a lot of administrative stuff, but I also teach and, you know, manage a team of teachers and then do the podcast as well. So lots of things that I'm doing. Yeah. So I found you through your podcast. And then when you made the jump over to top music, I was, you know, super excited for you because that's such a great opportunity. Um, So I don't know if you want to share any more about or or any about your podcast and the Tim top, that'd be great to hear little snippets of what you've learned about that or what that's Yeah, like. I would love to. So, okay. So I got the job at the conservatory and was kind of, you know, cruising along here for a year or so. And then my entrepreneurial creative bug sort of snuck up again. And I was like, <laughs> I want to do something. <laughs> and um, I got, I didn't know what for a while. And then I just this idea occurred to me that there's all these great resources out there for piano teachers, but they're kind of, sometimes they're hard to find or you're not quite sure where to look or whatever. So I thought, what if I did a podcast uh, that focuses on the fun side of piano teaching and all the resources and stuff? And once I got the idea in my head, I couldn't shake it. So I kind of went down a rabbit hole of how do you start a podcast? Uh, and it turns out it's not really that complicated. Like I got a microphone that you can see here. That's not right. that expensive. And, um, you know, just kind of did a little research. So I started that podcast, I think it was May of 2023. So it wasn't that long okay. ago, right. really. And I had only put out maybe about a dozen episodes. And I, um, I went to the NCKP conference in Chicago last summer, which is the, oh boy, I'm going to mess it up. National <laughs> conference for keyboard pedagogy. I think it's, that sounds right. <laughs> I think that's what it, <laughs> um, 
And it, my podcast was so new that I was almost like kind of embarrassed to talk about it because I was, I oh. felt like I hadn't really proven myself yet right. in podcasting, but, um, Tim Topham was there and it took me until the last day of the conference to get up the courage to introduce myself to him. <laughs> And finally, the last day he was down in the lobby and it looked like maybe he was about to leave for the airport. So I was like, okay, it's now or never. (laughs) So I went up and introduced myself and told him, you know, I'm the director of this music school. And I also, I'm sure I was so sheepish. I was like, I also just started this little podcast and I had a little business card that I gave to him. So he actually listened to my podcast. I was shocked. And then he also at the conference said, so I have this book coming out in the fall. If you would want me to come on your show, I would love to. And I was like, of course, like a hundred percent. I was like over the moon, excited that he would offer to come on my little podcast. Mm-hmm. So we did that interview. I think it was the end of October that he came on to talk about his no book beginners mm-hmm. book that he wrote, which is fantastic. If here. Yeah. Anyone wants awesome. to get a hold of that. Um, <laughs> and after I did the interview, he said, okay, this is going to come out of left field, but I want to take a break from podcasting. And I'm wondering if you would want to take over for a while. And I mean, I cannot tell you how shocked I was. Wow. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. that, like <laughs> so shocked. Um, but of course I said, yes, like it was such an amazing yeah. opportunity. So we kind of worked out the details. Um, we decided that I would have a a different show under the top music platform. So I have the top music piano podcast and um, he has recently started podcasting again. He took a few months off and then he's still now doing the integrated music um, podcast. So -hmm. that's kind of how that all came about. And it's been fun. Um, Top music usually does a theme each month. And so I've, I kind of fit the podcast into that theme. So it's been stretching for me because there's some themes where I'm like, Hmm, who do I know? And then I start asking my friends, like, do you know anybody who does such and (laughs) such? So it's a little different angle than my podcast was, but, um, I'm really enjoying it. And uh, cause I get to talk about like the business side and who knows, like all sorts of different things. So right. it's really fun. And I didn't feel like I could keep my podcast going. Maybe at some point I'll bring, I'll start doing like a couple of, a couple of episodes a month or something. But right now I felt like it was too much to try and do both. So I just put mine on hiatus right. for the yeah. time being. Awesome. And then you have recently an accompanying a uh, course for teachers yes. or for, or I guess for adults, it really doesn't need to be for teachers. It can be anyone mm-hmm. that wants to get better at playing with other people. Yes. Um, so, so yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> yes. Because I didn't have enough to do, right? <laughs> well, when I started the top music podcast, um, one of the huge benefits to working for them is that they have a team that does all of the editing and marketing and everything for their podcast. When I was doing my own podcast, I was doing all of that myself, and it took a lot of time. So when I started doing the top music podcast, I was like, wow, I have a little bit of extra time that I'm not spending doing all that editing. So I had wanted to create an online course for a long time and just didn't have the time or bandwidth to do it. But over, um, I guess over Christmas break, probably. I started thinking maybe I could actually do this now. Maybe I could get these recordings done for an online course. And my friend, um, Amy Elmore, who you might know in the piano teaching space, she also had been wanting to do a course for a long time. And we had talked about it back and forth a lot. And yeah, she she has the preschool, preschool, she has a preschool piano piano. curriculum. Yeah. Right. So she kind of gave me the little nudge, like, let's do this together. We can support each other. Did she was working on her preschool one and I was working on my accompanying one and we launched them around the same time um, back in March for the first time. So it's a course about accompanying, piano accompanying, which I told you the whole background of accompanying for me Mm -hmm. um, to help pianists who either have never done any accompanying but want to, or uh, maybe 
pianists who have done some, but feel like they have questions, they've never had any formal training and they want to kind of get to that next level. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I actually just launched it again recently. So it just started up again, um, this week. So they, the format of it is students watch the course, the videos online, and then we meet for like a little group coaching thing on Fridays, um, where they can ask questions and we can kind of dig a little deeper into some of the material and stuff. So, um, I haven't met my new students yet who just started, but the, for the first launch, the, it was so great, like seeing the students gain confidence in their abilities and, some of them, I think, just needed some reassurance that they actually were doing it right, <laughs> but mm-hmm. they just weren't sure they were doing it right because they hadn't had any training. They were just trying to figure it out. So um, I had a couple of piano teachers in that that group. I had um, actually a 17-year-old girl who was, you know, she had had classical piano training for many years and was just starting to do a little accompanying and Um, So she took the course just to learn more and see if that was something that she might want to pursue further. Um, So yeah, that's kind of my new adventure and it's been really, really fun so far. Yeah, I love that it's focusing on a a skill or a love that you already have and then turning into a passion that can also be beneficial financially or just provide more joy, you know, and connecting humans together and playing together. So I love that. I, I don't know anybody else who's really focusing on a company right now. So I, I love that you're, you're in, you're in the game now. <laughs> I know. I just, I have to find the people who are interested. I'm still, you know, the word right. is starting to get out a little bit, but I don't know of anyone else really who's focusing on it in this way I, yeah, either. Yeah. So I just have to get the word out to all the piano yeah, people who I, want to learn more. Yeah, I think there's probably more people who would really find a lot of joy in it. They just, yeah, they need that support system. They don't, they yeah. don't know where to start or how to connect with, you know, like, so I, I think, yeah, you provide a lot of value in the field right now for, for getting, making those connections with others. So yeah, super exciting. I had one question when you were talking earlier about your childhood and that you would sight read. So was there music laying around? Like how, what did you well, have that you yeah. could sight read? I mean, I say sight read. Sometimes it was just like picking up a book that maybe I had already gone through and just okay. playing through it. And then we also, this, um, sadly, this is kind of no longer the case, but there was a music store not that far from where we lived that had tons of sheet music. And, and so you could, so I would pull get like, like, yeah, I would get something that looked fun to me. Like, um, I did a lot of hymn arrangements that I uh-huh. like get a book of hymn arrangements and just sight read them. And then, sight you know, through. pick out a few to work on to play for church and stuff, or maybe a book of Disney songs or whatever it was like supplemental type stuff. My parents would, you know, they were supportive and would get me one of those when we'd go to the music store. Oh, see, that's great. Cause looking back, I was thinking, gosh, if I had had music laying around in my house, like if I'd had a book of Disney songs or him arranged, you know, that would have been enjoyable for me, but I just didn't have like, (laughs) unless your family buys it for you for Christmas or, you know, you specifically ask for it and they give it to you. You just kind of like, uh, I didn't have a music store close, but yeah. Yeah. So it's like, but now with in the digital age, I guess some kids can find new score. Like I've had a few students that can find free stuff. And sometimes I warn them and show them the, the issues with some of that stuff. Like, you know, this is not arranged really well for piano. And so we Mm -hmm. can talk about that, that, but, um, Yeah, I guess in in this age, maybe it's more accessible because they can find it online. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I used to also just grab the hymnal because we had a hymnal at the house and I would practice playing hymns. And so it always, it kind of surprises me when pianists can't play the four-part hymns. It is a skill, but I didn't realize like, because I just grew up doing it looking and, you you could see it from the very beginning as a child probably in church you could see the different yeah. voices and yeah if you've never looked at it like yeah it's a new yeah. it's a new skill as an adult if you've never uh-huh. cracked up in a hymnal before yeah it's 
yeah, just even in, in accompanying choirs and take, you know, that's, I think can be even more challenging than a hymnal if mm-hmm. you're used to, because it's, just, it's really spread apart. And <laughs> yeah, we talk so. about that in my course about reading, mm-hmm. it's called open score when each part is on a different line and it's really challenging. I mean, it's for me to challenging. this day, yeah. it is. Yeah. 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 Probably that. And then um, probably transposing. I'm just trying to think of, you know, all the things that I were challenges for me in accompanying, you know, through college and, and beyond and having yeah. to train, you know, when you're in a voice lesson and the teacher's like, you know what, actually, no, we, we want to do this a half step above or a whole step. And they, they just think that we can just, like, yes, like they we do. can just like, <laughs> Thankfully now, (laughs) a lot of those scores you can find online and get them in the right Yes, and just instantly, yes, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, because old school, we did not have that. No, (laughs) we didn't. So we talk about that. Another thing that um, a lot of pianists don't realize is that so many of the accompaniments are orchestral reductions. And so you actually don't have to play every single note. So I talk about like how to approach an orchestral reduction and how to know like what you should be playing and what you can leave out and all of those things. So I think that's hard for people that are classically trained like myself. Cause we, uh-huh. I don't know the perfectionist in me. It's like, Oh, well now I'm challenged. You say I shouldn't play. Well, watch it. I'm going to be the first human that can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've actually done that before in a trio that I was playing in and our coach at the time was like, Oh my goodness. What? I'm like, well, I did it. I did it. I pulled it off. Yeah. yeah, It it was (laughs) so unnecessary. (laughs) It didn't really improve the sound. Right. (laughs) Right. Yeah. But I was just like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to play every single octave and every single note and just, yeah. Yeah. That's funny. (laughs) So, um, so I guess what, what is the future? Do you have any like future plans or what do you, you know, what does the future look like for you? Oh, it's a good question. I would say in the conservatory where um the director, there's just some systems and things that I want to shore up, like just making our policies a little more um, you know, tight, tighten that up. Um and also I want to do a better job of training my teachers here at the conservatory and making sure they know all the resources available to them. And, um, you know, I don't want them to just be coming in, teaching their lessons and leaving and, you know, that's it. I want them to know that, first of all, I'm supporting what they're doing, but also supporting them with some of these exciting resources that are available for piano teachers. So that's kind of the conservatory thing. For the course, um, my plan is I probably won't la- launch the accompanying course until January is what I'm thinking. I think fall is just a little too crazy. Like once you get mm-hmm. to October, it's just like full speed ahead. So I don't think I'm going to launch until January, but if people are interested, please get on my email list. That's probably okay. the best way to know um, when I'm going to be launching again. And speaking of my email list, I, um, I've been so bad with sending out emails. Like I only send them out when I'm launching a course or have something new to say, but I'm going to try really hard this fall to focus on sending out like a couple times a month, a newsletter that actually gives some value to pianists, um, maybe some tips about accompanying or performance anxiety or whatever it is that can yeah. really help pianist. So um, that's kind of my focus for the fall. And then also you mentioned the sound effects stories and I have several that are specific for holidays. Like I have a Halloween packet and a Thanksgiving nice. story and a Christmas one. So I think I'm going to kind of focus on um, getting the word out about those two. So I guess it's kind of like a um, a nurturing few months, mm-hmm. maybe like trying to just take the stuff that I've done and uh, let people know about it and give, you know, as best I can to other teachers. And then I'm continuing to do the top music podcast as well every week. So awesome. Awesome. Well, if you could share all of your links in all the places that you are, and we can share with our community and, um, we'll post 
our little chat on YouTube and, and share on social media as well. So yeah. So thank you so much for sharing your journey and we wish you well in the next bends in the road. <laughs> thank you. So, it was so nice to be here, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. And thank you for asking me and talking with me. You're welcome. Thank you. Can you tell me more about Music Game Club? Is it a membership? So it is a membership. Actually, we're redoing our website right now and we're going to mm -hmm. launch. So we launch, we're going to be open twice a year. So we'll open July 22nd. Okay. Um, we'll open for two weeks. So yeah, it's a membership. And the big biggest change in our membership is if you're a monthly member, um, you get one point and you can pick whatever game you want. So mm. in the past, we've been releasing a new music theory game every month, and that would be the game that you get. Gotcha. We realized, well, what if what if they just want something else that we've already released and they missed out mm. on it? So now you get to pick whatever you want. So it's great. We have digital games, we have boom decks and bundles, and we also have printable games. So yeah, I think what makes us unique is our art. We have an artist on our team, so it's original mm. artwork. So it's like hand-drawn flamingos. We're coming out with a wow. beautiful sloth game, which is called Sloth Steps. So students have to identify. There's two different levels. So this is a good example of, we make sure that beginner students can play, but also more advanced students can play. And they can also play at the same time if they're in a group lesson or if they're siblings with back-to-back -back lessons. Um, so yeah, they're identifying half steps or whole steps on the keyboard or on the staff. Um, so an older sibling could play with a younger sibling, or you could do it in a class setting up to eight students at a time. Mm. So, yeah, so that's what makes us kind of a little different than all the other music games out there is our art. It's geared for one-on-one, -on -one, or it can be up to eight students at a time. Um, and it's multiple levels like we, and we have multiple ways to use the resource. So Amanda's really great at creating video tutorials that show how to how to also use the cards in a different way or use the game board in a different way or just review in a different way, the exact same concept. So yeah, that's what makes us stand out a little bit. Nice. So, yeah. That's awesome. So, wow. The, yeah. Having an artist, that's amazing. That's like a dream. Yeah. Huh? So, well, and even dreamier, our current artist, and this was a big, another big change that we made. Our current artist is also a musician, which is, amazing because we don't have to create all the musical assets for her to then manipulate. And then she mm -hmm. could not knowingly yeah. <laughs> make a mis huge mistake. Right. So yeah, we learn as we go. And now we're like, you know what, everybody on our team really needs to be a musician because we're talking, speaking, manipulating everything to do with music. And we can't have mistake, you know, like we want everything to be. So even yeah. the art, when it comes down to the art, like okay, you're drawing a sloth. Like, does it, do you really need to be a musician to draw a sloth? Well, no, but the car, like there are musical elements they're touching in our activity right. sheets. You know, the, now the artist can create the, art, the activity sheet that corresponds to the games to make sure that students actually know what the theme, you know, what the music mm -hmm. theory concept was kind of like a review sheet. Um, yeah. So she can create those and we don't have to babysit at all. Like it's, it's so oh, fabulous. Awesome. <laughs> so, wow. but yeah, it's, it, it was like finding a unicorn, you know, totally. finding someone that has a high art, um, level that's not just digital. That's mm -hmm. actually like, you know, you can sketch something and create something and imagine something and make it, you know, come alive. Um, and that's also musician. So yeah, we're super, super blessed. <laughs> wow. Super that's excited. Really cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, good luck with uh, thank launching you. in a couple of weeks here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you thank so you, you just launched the the membership twice a year and then like- That's those... the change that we're making. We've been open since January, 2023 and you could just okay. join whenever, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. at whatever tier you wanted. But now we'll have monthly memberships. You can also join just quarterly. So if you just are overloaded in games and you just need one new game a quarter, mm -hmm. then you can do that. Or, oh, you nice. know, if you, if you want- the year subscription, then you only pay for 10, but you can just hand pick 12 games right at the beginning. Nice. So you can save your points. You can save them up for camps. We're trying to make it as user-friendly as possible after mm -hmm. hearing back from the teachers, some feedback of kind of their 
what they were feeling as they moved through the games each month. Um, so yeah, sometimes having less is better. Yeah. <laughs> so we're offering that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, good luck. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All yeah. right. Well, we'll stay in touch and yeah. Um, yeah. I look forward to seeing, seeing more of what you create and produce. So. Oh, thank you. Thanks.